Okay, good evening guys, thank you all for coming today. Uh, let me start by asking you a question. How many of you uh, work with banks or fintech firms or financial services in any way? Okay, so most of us. How many of us have been working with financial services for more than 10 years? <laughs> I had a feeling. Um, well, I've been working as a designer for about 12 years now and about four or five years ago I fell in with financial services and uh, the whole social aspect that of banking that you know that banking can have on society. Uh, on a completely different note, that's my kid right there, his name is Tommy. He doesn't know anything about banking or body wax, but he makes my keynotes look good, so I always make sure I include him there. Keeps my girlfriend happy. Today we have a very special menu for you guys. We're going to talk about a bit of the recent history leading to the financial crisis from 10 years ago. Um, you know, the, how the banks are presently redefining themselves and how design and design processes are helping create the bank of the future, a more socially aware bank. For dessert, we have something very special as well, but I'll tell you more about it in the end. In the meanwhile, I'd like you guys to keep these three questions in the back of your head, mind. Uh, how have your expectations of banks changed since the crisis? What's going on right now for banking and technology? And what do you believe will happen in the future for banking? And we'll get back to these later. So banks, where do banks come from? What are they? Well, in the UK, the first experiments in modern banking took place around the 17th and 18th century. Uh, that's when several of today's banks were first launched, like Lloyd's and Barclays. And initially, banks had a very simple, um, they, were, they had a very simple function. They were goldsmiths. And if you were a merchant, you would keep your gold safe in their private vault, and they would charge you a fee for it. So pretty much, they were a vault. But as, as the years progressed, uh, banks started developing, developing a very complex responsibility in society. Part of their role was obviously to remain sustainable, because they're a business. But mostly their role was about greasing the wheels of commerce and being stabilizers of the economy. And so they were known to be very, fi very prudent financial institutions, you know, safe as a bank can be. I'm pretty sure everyone here nowadays has a slightly different idea of banks following the financial crisis when it became painfully obvious that they were not conducting their affairs in an honest way. So the obvious question is, what happened? One day they're pillars of the community, but the next day they're turning the world and the country upside down. So as far as I managed to research, this decline of the banking culture started on the 1960s and 70s. Uh, the government wanted started a series of banking reforms in an attempt to uh, transform the UK in, into a key global player in the, in the world economy. And well done for them, it worked. Today, London is the world's leading financial center. And such reforms actually included allowing banks to move beyond savings and loans into more lucrative areas like investment, investment banking. There are two caveats to this, though. One is the fact that while retail banking historically was about being reliable and providing service to customers, investment banking is about generating profits for shareholders. So as time passed by, uh, investment, bank, inve investment bankers, who by nature are usually very driven individuals, started rising to more and more senior positions in the banks and to influence the overall culture with their risk appetite and pursuit for profit. Which would have been fine if it wasn't for the second caveat. At the time, with these reforms, there was no ring fencing system between the bank's retail operations and their investment operations, meaning that failure in one of them would inevitably uh, compromise the other, which is what happened 10 years ago. Technology also played a big role in these reforms. Uh, there was this giant shift from local face-to-face -face, uh, branch banking to a centralized automated banking on an industrial scale. Suddenly we have 24-hour banking with cash machines, debit cards, credit cards. Uh, the world's first cash machine was actually installed here in the UK in Enfield in 1967 by Barclays. And obviously, these new services were designed to cut costs for the bank, but they were also designed to provide convenience for customers, uh, like cash machines, for instance. The idea behind cash machines was to free up time so that the staff inside the branch could actually provide a more personalized service and therefore improve customer relationships and loyalty. Unfortunately, what actually happened was that people were at the queue outside in the rain to use a cash machine, then go inside the branch to get some money. So, over time, these new services actually led to a reduction of people visiting the branch and a therefore a reduction of the bank's knowledge of their customers because it was their, the, bank, the branch was their real-life hub for collecting user data. So over time, this led to a, a, a lack of knowledge and empathy and awareness for the customer's problems. 
Nonetheless, banking continued to prosper by the 1970s. In the 1970s, about nearly half the adult population in the UK had a bank account. In the 1990s, it was already nine out of 10 adults, literally the double in just one generation. Other things happened. Uh, personal wealth increased in the UK. Uh, the 1970s, but mostly the 1980s, was, was a time of great economic optimism. And the UK became a nation of homeowners, literally taking out massive mortgages every year, uh, borrowing over 30 billion pounds per year and taking out massive mortgages. By the early 2000s, we were borrowing 80 billion pounds per year, and there were over 50 million credit cards issued and circulating in the UK. So pretty much the UK was borrowing way beyond its means and burying itself under huge amounts of debt. Ironically, because of competition and because of interest rates going down and because a lot of the services were now becoming free, like having a current account, the banks were actually making less money from their customers. So they started feeling pressured to use their customer base in a more efficient way, partly because of their need and pursuit for profit, but also because of a progressive loss of perspective, socially, economically, and morally. They became sales machines misleading customers into buying products that could prove more profitable to the banks, which in some cases didn't really serve the, cu didn't really serve the customers and in others actually put them at great financial risk. And then one day, all these domino pieces just met its end. Uh, you probably remember like in 2008 in Canary Wharf when the Lehman Brothers went bust. It was the biggest bankruptcy in his history and literally overnight, $600 billion just disappeared. And the consequences in the market were instant. Uh, the trust in markets went down, the lending between banks dried up, and the whole financial system seemed to be on the verge of a collapse. Fortunately or unfortunately, depending how you choose to see it, at the last minute, the banks were saved by a colossal government bailout. But there was still a social bankruptcy. Banks were no longer perceived as pillars of the community, and there was now an undeniable awareness that there was something fundamentally wrong with our culture not just in the UK, but worldwide. And amazingly, it's been 10 years already. It was actually just a few, a few weeks ago that we started mentioning the anniversary in the newspapers. Uh, something else happened 10 years ago, which I hope it's unrelated. The iPhone came out, and it paved the way for the smartphone revolution. Nowadays, uh, people have come to expect uh, much a great level of sophistication and transparency from their banks, and they expect to be able to do their banking any time anywhere. For many customers, smartphones and online banking have become their main, their main point of relationship with their bank, not the high street branch. And because expectations have changed from the consumer side, the market has adapted and changed as well. Up until recently, there were, banks didn't actually have a lot of competition, which is one of the reasons I had become extremely complacent as an industry. Nowadays, there are lots and lots of challenges, particularly in the fintech space. Uh, tech companies and startups who have launched in the market partly as a response to the financial crisis and who provide banking services despite not being banks themselves. But some of them are banks. Uh, in, in 2010, when Metro Bank launched, they were the first high street bank in the UK in over 150 years. There was no new competition in 150 years. Nowadays, it feels like every day there's something new happening in the industry. Uh, last year, we saw the launch of Atom Bank as, a world, as the UK's first mobile-only bank. And this year, we're seeing the launch of uh, Starling and Monzo as two fully licensed digital banks in the UK. Regulation compliance have also picked up, f fortunately, in an attempt to bring back consumer protection as a center stage priority. Uh, you guys probably remember when I mentioned there was no, at the time, there was no ring fencing between retail and investment operations. Nowadays, the government has, has have started a series of measures to ensure that their ring fencing is in place. So that if something happens, they don't have to build them out like they did 10 years ago. The FCA, previously the organization responsible for overseeing financial services, was dismantled and replaced by the FCA, FCA, FCA and the PRA, who have, as regulators, proven to be a lot more alert and responsive. Uh, to, in, in an attempt to help London keep its crown as a world leading financial center. For instance, in 2014, the FCA set something called Project Innovate, which is a bit of a regulatory sandbox to allow banks and fintechs to explore with innovative, with innovative uh, financial products in a regulatory safe environment.
Now, the relationship between legacy banks and fintech is, is a bit of a curious one. Many banks don't see <coughs> fintechs as a direct threat to their core business, but as a partner in innovation. Um, so as a partner in innovation, and as a means to help them improve their own financial services and make them more easy, more efficient, and more um, inclusive. Santander recently announced a partnership with Payki, uh, which will allow them to um, have a peer-to-peer -peer, peer -peer payments platform integrated into WhatsApp and F Facebook Messenger. Some fintechs, however, like the challenger banks or directly competing with the legacy banks. But instead of adopting the classic uh, full-service banking like the usual banks do, they're adopting a very different approach called marketplace banking, in which they provide not dozens of products, but one key product, let's say the, you know, the world's best current account. And then they partner up with different providers from around the market in an attempt to provide customers with the best financial thinking and products from across the entire market. So a bit like a financial app store, so to speak. And all of this is creating a very interesting dynamics in the market, R regardless of the, of the fintechs and the banks being in, in a collaborative relationship or in a competitive one, all, all, of this, all of these things that are happening now are helping invigorate the financial services industry. There's the, there's, we're currently experiencing a widening of the industry invigorated by fresh ideas and business mindsets. So what does this mean for the future of banking? How does a more humane bank of the future look like? Well, banking is becoming predominantly a digital service. So technology will continue to play a big role in this. And although there are a lot of new technologies coming into the market, most will only become relevant to consumer banking and that when they, once, they become integrated, uh, in, once they become an integrated part of people's lives and habits, meaning we'll see a lot of these new technologies become mainstream before banks consider investing in them. Uh, and this is because back, banks understand that people tend to be cautious with money uh, in the sense that they prefer to bank using the channels which they're already familiar with and they already have quick and easy access to. And most importantly, that they trust. And not just the channels, but also the brands. For instance, uh, Apple Pay and Touch ID are nowadays increasingly popular with consumers for completing purchases on, on their smartphones. So banks have begun adopting them for some of their products. And recently, Apple and Google announced a lot of developer support for augmented reality and uh, machine learning. So in the next few years, we'll probably start seeing these become an integrated part of you know, banking experiences. And banks are already experimenting with some of these technologies, machine learning, for instance. They're trying to, you know, many banks are trying to create robo-advisors which could help them uh, manage risk and anticipate market behavior. But there's another aspect of machine learning which is not often discussed in a banking environment, and that is of accessibility. And I'll give you the example of smart cars. The first time I heard about smart cars, my first thought was my 90-year-old grandfather who misses being able to drive my grandmother downtown for a cup of coffee. He misses his mobility and independence. So from an accessibility point of view, imagine a banking software that generally understands and adapts to your unique language and needs, physical, mental, and emotional. You know, a bit like your, your own virtual banker or financial advisor who's actually programmed to actively look out for you to find you the best deals and to tr always try to protect you from any fraudulent activities. The potential is amazing, particularly when you're at a vulnerable stage of your life. Education is another big topic. I don't know about you guys, but I pretty much learned two things from my parents when it comes to money. Work hard, save money. And for the most part, that has been really good advice. But nowadays, and particularly if you live in London, you probably have noticed that there's only so much you can save. And saving is not going to save you from every financial difficulty you encounter throughout life you also need to learn how to make your money work hard for you. Partly that means helping people develop a greater financial literacy, becoming more curious to what financial tools are available to them, but also helping them develop an educated emotional relationship with money, which pretty much you can, you can, you can do this by, in many ways, by just designing better products that just make sense. A lot of the products that we see nowadays don't make sense all the way down to the financial jargon we used to describe them, which is often very, very cryptic. For instance, when I do user testing, it, it's quite obvious how often people still struggle with understanding such simple concepts as an available balance and their current balance, which is why a lot of banks and fintech firms are completely discarding these concepts and instead trying to provide their customers with the real-time balance. 
So they always know exactly how much money they have, not just an estimate. So the future is looking, you know, all bright and shiny for digital banking. But for the 40% of bank customers na on the national level that haven't even signed up for online banking, it's a slightly different story. A lot of bank customers prob don't want or need digital, at least not in the way we're used to thinking about digital. They pass by the cash machine on the way to the pub to get some cash or check their balance, or they visit the branch once a week, and that perfectly suits their lifestyle. Obviously, that puts them in a more vulnerable position. But even for people with a more digital lifestyle, like myself and you guys, sometimes we, just, we also need to just go and talk to someone. Recently, when, after my kid was born, I got a life insurance. And I, I searched online, and I found one that I liked. But at the last minute, I decided to call this financial advisor that a friend of mine recommended. And ironically, I ended up buying the, the, this, I ended up buying the, the same, I, ironically, I ended up buying exactly the same insurance, but from the financial provider. So technically, I could have done everything just online. But with something with such serious repercussions as a life insurance, I needed that extra bit of trust. I needed that human interaction. So as designers, we still need to widen our perspective of the banking experience beyond the cool app and the cool website and provide alternative ways to bank for customers. Maybe that means rethinking banks, branches, and having smaller branches or neutrally shared branches among the various banks. Maybe that means maybe we won't need branches. Maybe we just need a phenomenal you know, telephone banking system like First Direct is, First Direct is usually, usually very known for. Or maybe we don't need any of this. Maybe we just need to provide, maybe we can use a, a conversation system like SMS or WhatsApp or Facebook. It all depends on what works for a particular market segment. Regarding the next couple of years, the biggest changes in, in banking are going to happen thanks to something called open banking, which will allow third-party tech companies to access your financial information using secure APIs. This is thanks to a new legislation called PSD2. So what PSD2 means is that if your bank has a really, really terrible app, you probably don't even need to switch banks to have a better app. You can just access your financial information, your transaction, and even make payments using a third-party app, kind of like your Gmail. You can use your Gmail on your dedicated Gmail app, or you can use your Gmail with the iPhone's mail app, which is service agnostic. So for consumers, this is great news because it means more competition, better prices, and more personalized banking experiences. But on a, on, a, on, a, on a bigger picture, it means that banks will not be the only ones reflecting and experimenting about banking, which could lead to a lot of innovative thinking in the industry. It, w w right now, we're at a stage where it kind of feels like we're starting to come full circle. Earlier, I was talking to you guys about the Goldsmiths and how they were the first bankers in the UK. And the goldsmith had a very simple task. The merchants keep the gold there, pay us a fee, and we'll give you a receipt, and you can come back here with the receipt and collect your gold again. But these receipts proved to be so popular, they, could, they continued being evolved. At some point, you could sign them and give them to someone else like a check. And at some point, they started being made out to the bearer, meaning there was no signature and there was no identifiable connection to any deposit of gold. It was just literally a piece of paper which is the cash we use nowadays, we use notes and coins. So probably not a very well-known fact, but 300 years ago, the UK invented the modern banknote. The Bank of England was the first central bank to, ini to initiate the permanent issue of banknotes. Nowadays, economists estimate that only 8% of the money circulating in the world exists in actual physical cash form. Most of it is just numbers getting ping-ponged from one computer to another. So a lot has changed in 300 years. And when it comes to technology, a lot has changed tremendously in just the last few decades, which is where we come in. At the end of the day, technology is just tools. And great tools require great thinkers and craftsmen to fulfill their maximum potential, which is a perfect opportunity for the UX community. Uh, we know users. Our entire, our entire life's work and career has revolved around users. So we can help these financial institutions bridge their business needs with their customer needs and in a way that's aligned and promotes fair exchange. Because banking is becoming predominantly a digital service, 
uh, the design of banking experience can no longer be the, the sole responsibility of a single designer or team, but of the entire business. So the UX community can actually engage with these companies on and use, we can use our individual and collective energy to help banks and financial institutions to rise in design culture and maturity. And hopefully, and I'm hoping I'm not being too romantic, but I believe we can actually solve some real societal problems and help users lead more empowered financial lives and hopefully help create a more meaningful and humane banking. And that's it. Thank you so much. I have one. I have a couple of questions. Um, you started to talk about how people lost trust in the banks. So what kind of methods are the banks or have the banks implemented to kind of restore the faith and improve the customer experience over the past few years? So that's a very good question. So, um, everyone could hear the question, right? So I did this presentation a couple of weeks ago at Lloyds Bank. And uh, when I finished the presentation, not a single person wanted to raise their arm and make a question. But at, when everyone left, two fellas who had been in the bank for quite a long time came in, came in chatted with me and said, like, you know, you're, you're very right. Ten years ago, this used to be like a sales machine. And they told me something very interesting. They told me, like, the, bis the biggest skill you can have in banking is to adapt. Because the skills you are required to have ten years ago are extremely different from the skills you're required to have today, and very likely which you'll have to have ten years from now. So it's all about adapting. What I see a lot of banks doing is understanding that they are starting to feel the social pressure. If a friend says, don't go to that bank because they're, you know, they're rotten, you will not go to that bank, no matter how nice your billboards or your ads or your banners online are. So it's all about, at this point, it's about figuring out how you can add meaningful value to your customer's life and keeping that aligned with your, with your business needs. So it, it's funny in a way because we lost, the, the branches used to be, like I mentioned, the actual physical place for collecting live user data. And that's why at the time, branch managers were very respected individuals because branches used to have the autonomy to decide loans and mortgages. So you wanted to be friends with the branch manager. In fact, they were like your best friends. You, you would even have seats on other businesses because you were actually part of that community. Their responsibility was to make sure that money flows in that community and everyone prospered. Then came credit score, which was a new system, and the branch manager were completely displaced. And now, when I do user testing, a lot of people say, like, I really miss having a branch manager. But that's not going to happen. So the best we can do right now is, and you know, a lot of the fintech firms are trying to use this, is collect user data. And the op open APIs from the open banking can be very useful. Collect user data using digital, from their digital experiences, from using their apps and their websites, and figure out what is that the people actually need. Because they're only going to be able to do it via the app and the website in the long term, I think. Bit of a convoluted answer, but I think I got there. Are there any more, any more questions? We have one at the back there. If you could, um, now I'm afraid we don't have a running microphone. Yep. Do, you, um, do, you ever, do you ever see any negative consequences to things like PSD2? So we've seen lots of information breaches take place in recent history. So anything that you see as a negative consequence from that? I'll be honest, at this point, it's, it's a bit hypothetical. I think the, uh, the negative solution, the ne the, if there was a negative, and this is very subjective, is the fact that the banks are going to have a lot more competition. But I'm going to be a bit of a, a cheeky monkey on this one, like, good for them, because they've been complacent for centuries. And right now, the only way they're going to evolve is if they feel a bit more pressure. Um, the PSD2 is being heavily regulated. So at this point, like, like I actually mentioned, like, secure APIs. I'm, I'm sure there will be breaches. I'm sure there will be some confusion in propagated in the media. But at this point, I'm actually extremely excited about open banking. I think it just open banking will just will just fuse into all these things, into inclusiveness, into accessibility, into education, and create in incredible experiences. Yeah. And um, just for that question, then, how does that how does that impact the customers' trust? Because obviously they've they're banking with a specific bank which they've trusted. To yeah. then put their details into another app, how 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 does that impact the trust of the customer? How do you build that up? Um, it's going to take a bit of time, but when you think about it, you've probably logged into dozens of websites using your Facebook account. So, probably a wider audience will be much more comfortable with this because they're used to. When I do user testing, it's it's just it's it's hilarious because people over thirty and forties actually bother to read things, and people like on their twenties and thirties just like click 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 click, and if I don't like, it, I'll just come back and switch it off. So I think. 
a certain audience will be much more risk comfortable and a few will just take their time before they start using this. But, you know, it could, it could be very interesting. Like I mentioned that 40% of bank customers in the UK don't do online banking. But something tells me that a lot of these people in these 40% use Facebook and WhatsApp. So imagine something, imagine being able to reach out to your customers in an environment that they are familiar with and they trust, like Facebook or WhatsApp. You're still being serviced by a reliable bank, but they're being approached in a language, in a platform, which is their preferred one. There's always a blockchain question, goddamn. <laughs> um, I actually prepared this time. I get, I get, I get destroyed every single day at this presentation because of Bitcoin. Um, I'm not terribly excited about the the Bitcoin bit because I see a lot of initial coin offerings happening right now, and it's just people seem to be going crazy about this. But the blockchain technology is absolutely amazing from what I've managed to research so far. And it, it works a bit like, it's like the world suddenly becomes a bit of a programming thing. If condition X is met, stop this and start this. So it's like they have something called, in blockchain they have something called smart contracts, okay? Which is just activate themselves without the need for human inter 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 interference. And I'll tell you why this is incredibly important. So I was reading a book right now on uh, off-boarding experiences, on closure experiences. And there was a story there that just literally gave me goosebumps. In the, st in the States, there was an insurance company or actually many insurance companies, who were consulting a public database to find out if their customers had passed away so they could stop paying their private pension. Right? So far, so good. But they were not starting to pay their life insurance. Okay? So this is extremely dishonest and non-transparent. So someone, a relative of, a relatives of yours has died. These guys went there, check, he's dead. Fine, don't send him any more money. But they know that this person had a life insurance and they know that their family is entitled to life insurance and they were not doing this. And when the, recently this was exposed, it was a bit of a scandal. So if this, if this had all been registered in blockchain, if the person's obituary was registered on blockchain, if the private pension was registered on blockchain and if the life insurance was registered on blockchain, it would have happened seamlessly. Person died, stopped paying private pension, start paying life insurance. So in a way, because it removes humans from the way, it allows for greater transparency and reliability. I, did, I, did it help? I think it's a nice story anyway. Okay. I want to thank Diablo again, please. Thanks, guys.